thank you to all our attendees for turning in, tuning in to the very first of CSE's plant protein sessions on the science of plant protein. My name is Mark Francis. I'm a senior advisor to Canadian Securities Exchange and work out of Calgary, east of the mountains, I should remember. Thank you also to all those in the plant protein industry who have helped us put this series together, in particular, Scott Exner of MLT Aikens, Canada's leading ag and food law firm, Brad Farkar, who is the CFO of Input Capital and Executive in Residence and Agribusiness at the Business Schools at the University of Regina, and Regina Economic Development as well, MNP, and Jim Harden of ABAC, based in Calgary. Today, we have two more sessions after this one. At 1 p.m. Mountain, we will have our own Barrington Miller with Scott Exner, senior partner of MLT Aikens, and Julianne Curran of Pulse Canada, talking about the big picture of plant protein. And at 215 Mountain, we will have Crystal Allen, also a partner with MLT, and Dr. Steve Webb, CEO of the Global Institute for Food Security, talking about the challenges of meeting the demand, science, and developing new products. Then we will move to Thursdays for February 4th, 11th, and 18th. On each of February 4th and 11th, there will be three sessions, with each session having two or three companies presenting. On February 18th, we will return to more general themes. May I use the term for all of these, a smorgasbord for investors when discussing food companies. And now to introduce our keynote speaker, David Fielder, who came highly recommended to us from several people in the field of plant protein. David has had a career as a natural products chemist for over 25 years, developing and commercializing botanical extracts from concept to commercialization. He possesses a strong business acumen, as well as having expertise in marketing, technical operations, and manufacturing. In his career, he's held executive positions in startup biotech companies associated with the global cosmetic and personal care sectors. Currently, he's a senior scientist with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry's Bio-Industrial Opportunities Section, the Value Added Fractionation and Natural Health Products Program in particular, which he leads, assists companies in developing novel and innovative botanical ingredients, cosmetics and natural health products, and the scale up of their manufacturing processes. David has also run his own independent consulting business since 2012 in Edmonton, and it is in this capacity that he'll be giving this presentation today. I would therefore venture to say that the opinions he expresses are not a government's, but his own, which to those who know me well, will not be surprised to hear me say I find far more valuable. David, it's yours. Thank you very much, Mark. And we'll just go ahead and, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Canadian Securities Exchange for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you this morning. And essentially, this uh, presentation is, is a fairly high-level one and an introduction to plant-based proteins. And so for those uh, that are listening right now and want to learn a little bit more about what plant-based proteins are all about and what the hype is and the trends, um, I think this will be a, a very good introduction. And the topics that I'll be discussing will be really a good segue to some of the other presentations that you will hear uh, over the uh, coming weeks uh, regarding the, uh, the whole plant-based industry. So, of course, I have to have the ubiquitous disclaimer here indicating that the information and views uh, that I'm presenting are, are solely those of the presenters. So, uh, with that in mind, we'll just move uh, on to talking about some of the content uh, this morning. The importance of plant-based proteins is always one uh, of interest. Uh, we've seen it in the, the consumer when we go to the grocery shops and we see all these new products um, in the meat aisles, in the dairy aisles, uh, in the various packaging, um, snack foods, and so forth. Um, but uh, the, this sort of begs the question uh, to be asked, what is the importance of these plant-based proteins? Um, and I think it's also important in, in order to understand where this industry is going and where the interest is, is to understand fundamentally what are proteins, uh, what are the structures and the function of them, and then look at some comparisons between plant-based proteins and, and animal-based. And then finally, I want to focus on 
well, how do you extract proteins from various seeds and oil seeds um, and, uh, and produce ingredients that go into the food industry? And then finally, talking a little bit about the Canadian opportunity and the future and some potential growth areas. So why are plant-based proteins important? Well, essentially, there's a very fundamental and very simple answer, and that is global demand. Right now, the global population is about uh, 7.8 million uh, billion people. And by 2025, we'll have another 2 billion people on the planet. And due to uh, climate change, expanding population, there's just not enough arable land uh, for us to continue expanding out uh, with animal-based meat products uh, that provides us with most of the protein that we're consuming. And so the idea of um, alternate plant or alternate protein sources uh, is becoming extremely important. And we can only have to look at really the market growth um, over the last five years to see uh, that there's just a tremendous explosion of new products, new innovation, as uh, these plant-based proteins are coming to market. Now, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but if we look at the top left-hand corner, you can see a graph there that shows uh, the rise of plant-based products in the fast food markets. And in 2016, there were no plant-based products on the market. In fact, there wasn't even an industry segment uh, back in that time. And then you can see that we have that proverbial hockey stick uh, that is showing that well into 2020 and beyond, we can sit, we'll consider more and more companies um, getting into this uh, into this sector. And so it's no longer sort of considered perhaps a fad or a trend, but now it's becoming very much more mainstream. And so a couple of statistics that I've put on this slide shows that the global meat substitutes or alternative meat substitutes are growing uh, very, very well. Um, and even, even better are the global uh, dairy substitutes uh, where even in Canada, we have seen uh, growths of 25% in just the past year. And so as uh, food scientists um, and the processors are able to manipulate and, and develop new products and new forms of the plant-based proteins, we'll see a much wider range of products coming to market. And so why are consumers drawn to plant-based pro uh, proteins? Um, essentially, there's really just four indicators. One, obviously, is taste. Uh, that would be sort of to be expected. A lot of products that were plant-based, if we go back 10 years or so, uh, with some of the early soy and pea products, uh, they tasted like cardboard. Uh, they sometimes were bitter or stringent, and um, they just didn't um, taste uh, similar to what they were trying to mimic, and that was a meat product. Um, but today, uh, with the advent of all sorts of new technologies and modifications of plant-based proteins, um, taste is becoming uh, something that that people are are sort of turning to. It's not. Uh, it's no longer sort of a curiosity for the consumer. Um, consumers are now going out and looking for vegetable-based products. And of course, health is very important, and number two, uh, because with uh, the various plant proteins and the other components from uh, seeds, beans, lentils, and so forth, one has all sorts of other additional health benefits uh, from cardiovascular health to um, uh, gut health and the ability to essentially increase your fiber and uh, rely a little less on, on meat. The third component is the environmental impact, uh, since we know that uh, raising uh, animals uh, takes up a lot of land, uh, it increases uh, greenhouse gases, and requires a lot of water uh, to produce an end product, whereas one has a very sustainable industry when it comes to uh, working with crops and extracting uh, proteins from those plants. 
And then finally, there's a, uh, there's a component of animal welfare, uh, knowing that uh, people are working with plants uh, instead of uh, various uh, animal type products. So this is a little bit of chemistry for the next two slides, and I promise to keep it uh, fairly light. Um, but what are proteins and why are they important? Well, uh, proteins are some of the largest complex molecules that are produced by both animals and plants. Um, they typically provide a structural component in plants. Um, but in humans, they have a wide range of activities. So things like enzymes, uh, antibodies, um, you, most people are familiar with adrenaline, insulin, uh, which uh, the molecule on the left-hand side is a, a three-dimensional representation, uh, representation of what insulin looks like. But important is that our bodies can't store protein like we can store oils and fats and sugars. And so we have to obtain it from our diet. And fundamentally, uh, proteins all come down to a number of very simple building blocks, and these are called amino acids. There's 21 natural amino acids, and there's nine essential amino acids, and these are ones that our bodies can't produce. So we have to get that from our diet. But not whether it's a plant or whether it's an animal, um, these building blocks, these amino acids, are linked to together. Um, to form a chain called polypeptides. And so as you start um, linking these polypeptides, then these are on the road to producing proteins. And so depending on where these different amino acids, which are outlined here in different colored balls, depending on how they interact with their neighboring or spatially um, neighbored um, amino acid, they can form uh, a helix type structure, or in some cases, a beta pleated sheet, which looks a bit like an accordion. And then these combinations can be connected again uh, together to form more complex structures. And some examples, obviously, that we would all be familiar with would be things like our skin, which is primarily collagen. That's the, the strength component of the skin. And then the elastin, which gives it that suppleness and that flexibility. Uh, hairs and nails are, are fairly, uh, have a strong type, uh, very linear type of protein called keratin. And our muscles have a number of different uh, uh, different types of proteins that allow for contraction, uh, expansion of muscles, and that flexibility that's required. And so while these are visual type of proteins, of, of course, our body has many tens of thousands of other types of proteins that are used in many different ways. And similarly, with uh, different crops, um, they produce uh, proteins as well as other components, and those are the proteins that we're interested in. Different proteins will come from different, uh, different grains or different oil seeds, different nuts or different pulses, but they will have uh, similar chemical um, structures, but not necessarily the same functionality. And that's where one can take or make use of those functionalities to either use, um, for instance, a pea protein on its own or combine it with other proteins, plant-based proteins, to give different functionality that you need for a food application. So all of the um, crops on this uh, slide, one can buy uh, commercially um, in, in, in the case of the, the plant proteins. So this next slide just gives you a bit of an idea of the types of nutrients that are in all grains and oil seeds. It's a little bit of a busy slide, but I just bring to your attention that uh, in gray, we have a lot of the carbohydrates, and these are typically starches, which would be found in, in the various seeds. Uh, proteins can also be extracted from things like canola or hemp or soy, and you can see that the, the orange part of the pie chart is the oil component, and, uh, and you can see that they uh, would have a lot less or, or virtually very little carbohydrate or starch.
So in the plant, the starch is the storage, the energy storage component. And in the oil seed, the oil is the energy storage component uh, for that seed. So some of the differences between animal protein and vegetable protein, um, in, in many cases, there can be a direct substitute for plant-based proteins um, compared to an animal-based uh, product or ingredient. Some of the notable differences is that uh, animal protein certainly has strong iron and vitamin B12, which is lacking in plant-based proteins. However, they can, they can be obtained from uh, other sources or, or supplements. Some of the things that the plant-based proteins uh, have, uh, which is um, uh, beneficial over animal proteins, is that it's a good source of uh, dietary fiber cholesterol-free, and there's a number of uh, very interesting phytonutrients that come from different plant protein uh, products that have nutritional benefits. So if we go back to the chemistry, um, the animal protein is typically a very fibrous material. If you think about a steak um, and you cut through it, if you cut it in one direction, you're cutting across those fibers. And if you cut it in another direction, you're cutting along those fibers. And that's what gives you the texture and the, the mouthfeel uh, when you're eating a meat product. And on the other hand, you have a plant-based protein, which is uh, very much more globular in nature. And so one of the challenges for food chemists and, and processors of proteins that extract proteins is how can you modify those proteins to give similar type of textural properties that animal proteins have. And some of these functionalities that the, the food industry is looking for uh, from a plant-based protein is first of all, it should have a neutral taste. Uh, when you're eating a product, you don't want to be um, realizing that you're eating a specific plant material uh, necessarily because some of these um, plants will have a fairly strong taste. The ability for that protein to absorb and bind up water is important when producing certain types of products. Uh, proteins, as we know, can make very nice emulsifiers. We can only look to uh, mayonnaise-type products <clears throat> to see how well that works. Texturizers, as we talked about, and, and the ability to have that type of mouthfeel um, like, a, like a meat product, a typical meat product or conventional seafood product is, is certainly very important. And there's been certainly very, very many good strides over the past five to 10 years. Foaming agents would be um, the ability to replace eggs with a plant-based material. And so if one looks at egg white, egg white is a, a natural protein called albumin. And when you beat it up, it turns nice and frothy and has a different structure. The, the protein is changing as it's um, taking up air. And so one can uh, do the same thing with various plant-based proteins. Um, they also gel very nicely and can be used in a wide range of beverages. And by modification of those proteins, you can adjust the range of solubility so that it can be included into uh, quite a number of uh, products. And so this slide just gives a little bit of an idea of the, the breadth of, of products that can go out there and also the type of marketing that is, is being used to try and promote protein uh, and especially plant-based pro proteins in a wide range of products. And not only are they for food, but they're also for health products and also for areas of cosmetics, personal care, and various bio products. So one of the questions I was asked is to make a comment about why is Western Canada ideal for developing a plant-based protein industry? And I think there's really a number of points and I could probably have listed a lot more, but you know, obviously we have an abundant agricultural capacity. Uh, we have a very, very strong industry. Um, the region is home to many agricultural companies, various food companies. We have some very good innovation R&D centers uh, from the Crop Development Center in uh, Saskatch uh, Saskat uh, Saskatoon. 
Uh, we also have the Food Development Center in Portage La Prairie. And here locally, we have the Food Processing Development Center in Leduc. So these are all areas where new products, new processes can be developed for companies and get those new technologies into the marketplace. And of course, we have a, a very well and organized inf uh, infrastructure, transportation hubs and our international markets. So this is more of a, an info map, uh, but it just gives you an idea of the type of uh, areas and regions where various crops uh, are grown in Western Canada. And of course, in Eastern Canada, there's, uh, th there's a, a wide range of various crops that can be grown there. However, in Western Canada, we have uh, well over 80% of the, the growing capacity uh, in Canada. And so other than canola here, you can see that uh, the various legumes, which include the peas and uh, the pulses, which are the dried peas, lentils, beans, fava beans, uh, chickpeas, all grow very well in the province here. And we're seeing increased uh, demand for those crops uh, year after year. And the pulse proteins um, have a lot of growth or have seen a lot of growth in the past uh, number of years because they really do check off those four boxes that the consumer is looking for uh, in the one of the very first slides. Global uh, food security, climate change, uh, agriculture, and also health. And especially pulse proteins have uh, a number of uh, very good health um, uh, components which uh, make them very favorable in various food products. So briefly in this section, I just want to cover off a few slides about how protein is extracted from plants. This is um, a few slides of various plant uh, fractionation facilities. All but the one in the upper left-hand corner uh, are all are being constructed in Canada right now. So you can see that this is no uh, mean feat. Uh, these are not small operations. And companies will want to take whole seed coming in and fractionate it, splitting that seed or that oil seed into various components like the fiber, like the starch, like the oil, um, and so forth. And so we've, we're seeing a number of facilities in Western Canada uh, being constructed right now or, or in current operation, and we hope to see more in the future. So essentially there's two major, um, major methods for producing plant-based proteins uh, from various seeds. And these are either termed dry fractionation or wet fractionation. But before the seed is actually um, fractionated, one has to go through a series of pre-cleaning and sorting steps. Um, most seeds will have uh, a non-nutritious hull on the top, which has to be removed. And currently those hulls are typically ground up and sold into the animal feed industry. If there's a product like canola or hemp, uh, then the oil is uh, typically removed beforehand because A, it's a fairly high percentage of that total composition of that seed. But more importantly, uh, having the oil around is, is uh, very uh, detrimental to the actual fractionation process. So trying to remove the protein and isolate the protein when there's oil um, present is quite difficult. And then finally, the um, material is then ground to a, to a flour or to a specification that allows that separation to start to occur. So in the case of dry fractionation, this is where one uses uh, the knowledge that there's a difference in density between protein and starch. And so on the left hand or right hand side of the slide, you can see that going into an air classifier, which is uh, a unit uh, essentially like a cyclone with lots of air, the, the more dense uh, starch will fall to the bottom of the classifier chamber, while the protein-rich fraction makes its way to the top. 
And so in this type of process, you have two streams, which then uh, you can sell into two different product areas. And this is a relatively inexpensive process um, because you essentially have uh, one large machine that is doing your fractionation. Um, but here one has to start looking for some of the other type of markets or the other type of markets that would be used for both that fiber and that starch fraction. When we come to wet fractionation, as the term uh, indicates, one uses uh, water uh, to start extracting out the protein. Um, by changing the pH of that water, one can help solubilize the protein. And then through the use of centrifuges, you can separate out the starch and the fiber uh, from the protein fraction. And proteins, because they contain a charge, can be precipitated. And so that's um, the next step in terms of isolating the protein from the sugars uh, once the fiber and the starch has been removed. And then that protein can either be concentrated uh, and then spray dried. And so you get a protein powder. So um, this next slide just briefly shows the two different types of uh, um, products that come out of it. Typically, protein concentrates uh, are between 50 and 60 percent protein purity and uh, typically made using a dry fractionation process. Uh, in green, you can see some of the benefits to that process. Um, and in red, some of the, the challenges. Uh, whereas in wet fractionation, isolates are typically well over 80%. And now in the marketplace, um, protein concentrates of 90 and 95% are starting to become more and more common. So in some concluding remarks, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the growth areas. Um, over the next few years, I think we'll certainly see new sources of plant-based uh, plant proteins coming from different crops and also being able to uh, take other side streams and utilizing and isolating the, the proteins from those, uh, which will ultimately lead to different functionality and the ability to essentially mix uh, both animal and plant-based proteins. And for the longest time, it was either and or. So you would either try to market a plant protein or an animal protein. And sometimes the plant protein uh, didn't win out because of the uh, taste or a functionality. Um, but one is, what is seeing a lot of uh, food companies now blending in various plant proteins and animal proteins to get the benefit of both. Uh, canola protein development for food and animal feed is uh, is something that I think has tremendous opportunities in Western Canada, and we'll see uh, some some very interesting development in in the next few years. Um, some of the other areas in the non-food sector, um, cosmetics and natural products, will continue to garner the benefits of plant-based proteins um, because, in, essentially, our skin uh, is is an organ. Uh, it's protein and it has benefits when other proteins are applied to the skin. And then we'll also see other types of plant sources such as algae and yeast being developed um, as the technology is, is coming along for both of those type of, uh, uh, those type of plants. Uh, and so overall, I think there's a lot of really good benefits and a lot of good opportunities for plant-based proteins as we move into the future. We've had tremendous growth since um, 2016, 2017, and it doesn't look like this trend or this mainstream trend is going to slow down any sooner. So on that note, I'll thank you very much and I'll pass you back to the moderator. So, uh, well, that's, pardon the pun, or, or the uh, the double entendre, a lot to chew on, David. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear about my favorite pumpkin seeds and cashews carrying protein. Uh, but what about my beloved Trader Joe's dried coconut chips? And, and, and well, just Mark, as evidence, um, I do have the others here too. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, coconuts, uh, any, any sort of plant will have protein and it just depends on how much is in there. Um, 
clearly uh, you're eating your coconut for the high level of fiber that it contains and plus the nice sweetness to it. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite possible that uh, during the process of those uh, chips that are being produced, there must be or there may be a wastewater component that contains protein. And it really wouldn't surprise me if someone has figured out how to extract uh, that protein out of that wastewater or from the coconut uh, byproduct and is now selling it. So um, keep an eye out on the store shelves for that. Very good. So let's go back to the basic. Let's go to where that plant starts producing protein. Does that, does the process of of producing those complex molecules tax the plant or so, soil nutrients? Um, well, there's two parts to that question. First of all, uh, the protein is is an integral part of, of any plant, um, whether it's the seed, uh, whether it's in the stalk, uh, in the leaves. Um, and in many cases, that, that protein is there um, as a structural element. So if you don't have that, uh, you don't have uh, very much um, of a plant to begin with. What's important is that um, when the, the plant is growing, it's, it's obviously producing these amino acids. So it's, these are the fundamental bu building blocks. And so the, the main components for those are either oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. And one of the things that obviously is required uh, when you're growing a crop is that you need that nitrogen source. In the case of things like cereal grains, like wheat, oats, barley, um, and even canola, um, one has to get the uh, nitrogen uh, somehow. Uh, and most of the time that comes in the, in the form of fertilizer or that's naturally present in the soil. When we talk about something like pulses, uh, these um, a type of crops uh, are known to be nitrogen fixating, which means that they absorb uh, nitrogen uh, from the air, convert it to uh, ammonia, and that could get taken up by the roots and used by the plant. So um, in this case, um, you're not taking away a lot from the soil. Um, the, the plant is producing it in situ, as it were. So let's talk a little bit more about Western Canada. And um, is one of the bonuses of growing plant uh, plant food in Western Canada that there's minimal industrial pollution? Is that relevant as well? Well, I think so. Um, now nowadays, consumers are very interested in where their food comes from, um, and also where it's grown. You know, uh, we're very fortunate in Canada to have. Uh, clean soil, clean water, clean atmosphere. And if you look at other countries around the world, um, they may not be so fortunate. And so getting things like heavy metals into your into the food chain, um, having various pollutants and hormones in the water that find their way into plants and plant uh, products is always a concern. And so we're very, very fortunate in Western Canada, and, and in fact, most of ca uh, Canada, to, to have very good uh, growing conditions that allows us to have a um, very, very high quality product um, that is not only sustainable, but is also traceable. Okay, and, and we do have a question in the chat board I'll get to in a bit. Um, but I uh, also wanted to ask you about, about the fractionation process and it seems that we to date we've been exporting a lot of product that might simply have for instance in the case of peas just been split um, is there much room for us to be adding more value in Canada uh, rather than just exporting uh, pretty much raw agricultural product um, the, the the answer to your question is simply yes um, and this is my personal belief. I mean, Canada has always been a country of exports. Uh, we ship all of our materials overseas and someone else uh, creates value uh, from those raw materials. And so if you were to look at a pyramid, you would see that you would have seeds on the bottom. Um, as you start to fractionate various components, um, you work your way up to the top of the pyramid, which has a higher value and maybe a lower output. But the important thing with fractionation is that you get a number of different products that come out 
um, that the sum of the components is greater than the whole. Uh, one of the things um, by having an industry developed in Western Canada is, is clearly that the crops that are grown here don't have to be shipped around the world. They can be processed close uh, to where the markets are. Um, we have our largest trading partner just to the south of us. And so any products, whether it's protein, starches, fiber, they can move in many different directions once they've been produced. So lots of, uh, lots of opportunities. And to the chat board question, what are the challenges of bringing costs down further? Why and uh, where do we, I would add, where do we rank uh, worldwide in terms of costs on these? Um, it, it depends on what uh, what is meant by costs. Um, costs of the, the finished ingredient, uh, perhaps. Uh, one of the things with uh, any sort of fractionation process or any sort of manufacturing, uh, manufacturing process for that matter is, is the cost. Um, there's a capex cost and there's an opex cost. Um, in the case of dry fractionation, uh, you essentially are cleaning seed, uh, splitting seed, milling seed, and then classifying it. So you'll have two fractions, a protein and a starch rich fraction. Now, if there's markets for those, that's great. Um, if you need something that's of a higher concentration, then of course, uh, when you start using water, uh, you're using larger pieces of equipment. Um, I've heard that the uh, cost differential between a dry fractionation facility and a wet fractionation facility can range anywhere from five to ten times the cost of a dry fractionation facility. And so there's a lot of a lot of costs involved. Uh, one has to look at what are you doing with your side streams and your waste streams. And so a lot of these facilities will be multi-product uh, in nature. So they will, you can't just go after the protein alone because that won't be necessarily economically viable. You have to have markets for all of those components. Um, but right now uh, the market is, is open. Um, when you talk about proteins from different sources and to answer the question a little bit more succinctly, if you were to take, for instance, a pea protein, you could take five different pea proteins from around the world and they would all have very, very different taste profiles. Uh, they could be used in some products and not others. And it really depends on how the protein has been uh, extracted and processed. And so I think this is where innovation um, from processors in Western Canada and from companies that are coming into, into Canada to set up those facilities are looking to um, meet the needs of those food processors. What do they want to produce products that are really good? And we've all been out to grocery shops where we've tried something and thought, uh, it's, it's, it still tastes like ground peas or, or, or ground hemp seed. Um, but then there's products that you try and you think, wow, this is really, really quite good. And it all depends on the quality of the protein. And, and because of that, the prices mm. will vary. Very interesting. Uh, you, you got to the, uh, end of the end of the chain there, the, the, the product on the shelf. And someone is asking, why do we find so much salt in plant-based foods, sometimes at least? Well, that's a good question. And uh, there's probably two answers to that. One is that um, quite often these proteins will have a very neutral or a bland taste. And so uh, one has to add a lot of different flavors and, 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 and fragrances. Salt is one that obviously helps bring out the flavors in many cases. In some cases with the protein, part of the process um, creates uh, salt and that may end up in the, in the final product. But I would say the, the overwhelming answer, and I'm not a food chemist, is that um, you know with the blandness of the protein, one has to add other components. If you think of something like a steak, you've got uh, those nice fatty uh, components um, marbled throughout your steak. Um, you've got other components in there that when you do cook that steak, it has a, a really nice wide range of different flavors. And if you take a pea or, or a, a canola seed or you take uh, a soy, 
and you put it on uh, on the barbecue, it's not going to taste quite the same. So adding adding flavors and components are are something that. Uh, takes a lot of inv innovation, but we're seeing that some of those salt levels are certainly coming down. You know, that's uh, that that's really interesting, and I, I think uh, in the third session today, we're we're going to focus uh, to a large degree on uh, on the challenges companies have in in getting a product onto the shelves, and then of course we're going to have a whole series of companies that are getting products on the shelves. Um, you know. One last question before uh, we have to close. Uh, Western Canada's farmers are, uh, well, and as far as some politicians are concerned, uh, very independent-minded, maybe even ornery. Uh, the independent farm organizations are pretty strong and uh, the farmers themselves have a lot of experience in working together uh, through companies, co collaborative companies, let's call them, not, not just co-ops, but actual for-profit companies that they uh, were as, uh, as growers and investors, they collaborate, but with, with this, the, uh, the roles and responsibilities clear. Uh, do you think that has uh, an influence on our ability and, and all of these farmer organizations that exist to, uh, is that part of the reason why Western Canada and, and Ontario have done so well in this space? Well, I think so. Um, again, I guess you're talking, you're asking the question to a chemist and not to uh, someone in the agricultural field or agronomist. But um, the interactions that I've had with the various stakeholder groups um, across the the, uh, the prairies here uh, certainly alludes to what you were saying. They're, they are very strong, very passionate about what they're doing, and they're looking at what are the, the next opportunities. Uh, right now, we're, we sell a lot of our wheat uh, and our canola goes overseas. Uh, we do some uh, processing which goes into the animal feed area. Um, but um, as we're seeing changes in climate, uh, you know, there's climate change obviously occurring, that we're seeing uh, crops that maybe 50, 100 years ago didn't grow very well in the, in the Western Canada and are growing very well today. Um, farmers and growers have always been very entrepreneurial, as you've indicated. And, you know, I've had uh, some talks with various seed cleaning companies. They've got equipment in place. They want to expand. They're looking for new opportunities. And, um, you know, even something like a dry fractionation process where they're taking part of that seed and converting it into value-added components uh, allows them to grow their business, create uh, additional revenue, and uh, and supply the market that needs that product. So I think um, those, uh, those stakeholder groups are very, very important to have and certainly will be part of the success story in the future in Western Canada. David, thank you so much. We're, we're now at the end of our time. I we really want to thank you for your, not just your time, but your preparation, your knowledge. Um, I would point out to people that uh, you would be an excellent consultant to them because you do carry on an independent consulting practice. Uh, David, would you like to uh, give your email uh, out to people or your phone number for contact? Uh, or certainly people can contact us and we would be happy to, to do that. Yes, um, thank you very much for the, the plug and uh, at, at the risk of uh, trying to take up more time, may, perhaps uh, maybe uh, Mark, you can pass that information on. Um, certainly if anybody's interested, they can reach me through LinkedIn and uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, assist them. If there's any projects that are related to uh, extraction and uh, early concept work, um, uh, I can certainly be reached and uh, we can certainly find uh, people that can help you in the right areas. But I'm very happy to be here uh, this afternoon and uh, I wish you well in the rest of the, the presentations, uh, both today and uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you, David. This has been excellent. As investors, we need this kind of background. We already make decisions in other sectors, such as mining or oil and gas and real estate, with this kind of basic knowledge lying subconsciously in our brains. Uh, but in the world of plant proteins, we're probably, we've probably been deficient, and your session will help many investors make better decisions. Thank you also to the CSE team, in particular Grace Pedota, Barrington Miller, and the extended CSE team. Stay with us or sign back in at 2 p.m. Mountain Time as Barrington Miller hosts Scott Exner and Julianne Curran 
with a big picture view on plant protein and Canada's role in the world and come back on February 4th and 11th for a whole smorgasbord of companies. This is Mark Francis with CSE, having hosted David Fielder, signing out. Thank you. <laughs>